Welcome to the Russell Talk News. I'm Pete Quinnell. It's been less than a week since CM Punk returned to WWE in one of the most shocking returns in wrestling history. So yeah, we're still talking about him because boy howdy, have there been some updates about everything going on. Punk made an appearance on Raw this week, ending the show with his first promo in a WWE ring in nearly 10 years. So naturally, we want to know everything about what happened that day. Did people kiss him on the mouth? Did he have a muffin backstage? Fightful Select has some deets for us where they report that Punk was in good spirits backstage at Raw and we seemingly on his bed best behavior. There may have been a reason for that though, as while it couldn't be confirmed by Fightful, there were reportedly those in WWE who were told by higher ups that Punk has a behavior clause associated with his contract. PW Torch also reported on the good vibes backstage with Punk, with one wrestler reportedly noting then that Punk knew he kinda had to be on his best behavior at Raw, but one source also reportedly told them that about half of the wrestlers are iffy on if Punk has actually changed or not. Perhaps this behavior clause is why Triple H felt comfortable missing Raw this week, because according to PW Insider, he was absent from the show entirely, with Bruce Pritchard running the show instead. The reported reason for this was because he and Nick Khan were in Los Angeles working on securing the media rights deal for Monday Night Raw. And what an advertisement. Look! We have CM Punk on our show now, but that might not be the end of seeing CM Punk on WWE programming this week, as according to Fightful Select, Punk is listed as a free agent right now internally in WWE. So there's every chance that he could be showing up on SmackDown this week too. But there's not just details on Punk in WWE, as there's also more details on his firing from AEW. It had been reported recently that Brian Danielson was part of the disciplinary committee who ultimately advised Tony Khan to fire CM Punk. But there's a little more on it. According to Fightful Select, it was a three person committee made up of Brian Danielson, AEW General Counsel Chris Peck, and an outside attorney, with the committee actually being headed up by Danielson. When asking AEW sources about Danielson's inclusion in the committee, Fightful note that one said to them that Danielson was an appropriate moral compass who exemplifies objectivity. So that, I mean, that's Keith Lee, right? But there's more, because that's not the only wrestler leaving AEW that Punk's been involved in. QT Marshall recently resigned from AEW, with reports noting that he wasn't a fan of the direction AEW was heading in. But now, there's more. Wrestle Purist reported that CM Punk didn't want QT Marshall on collision, with him reportedly feeling that QTV was doing no favors for the presentation of Powerhouse Hobbs. Fightful Select corroborated this, and also added that QT was scheduled to be a big part of collision on and off screen, but Punk reportedly nixed it. Tony Khan reportedly directed the blame for this with QT, which damaged their relationship. Also of note was the fact that the direction of the company news that had emerged regarding QT's resignation is reportedly not the reason he left the company, but it was something he disagreed with. But that might not be the only wrestler leaving AEW before long, because there's some signs that Britt Baker might be growing frustrated with AEW's booking. On X, the former women's champ posted, Tonight's AEW Dynamite, MJF live promo time, 7 minutes. Christian Cage live promo time, 10 minutes. All of 2023 AEW Dynamite, Britt Baker live promo time, 0 minutes. Far from the first time AEW's booking of its women's division has been criticized, nor will it be the last. Now, over to Ollie. It's Thursday, you know what that means. My review of the Go Home episode for the Winter Is Coming Go Home episode of... of AEW Dynamite. E episode. In, a, in about five minutes, that's right. That, yeah, that's right. Solid Snake Brian Danielson joined commentary for the opening Continental Classic match in the Gold League. John Moxley versus Jay Lethal. Danielson was excellent on commentary for all the tournament matches of the night. You could say he's the best in that ring, on that microphone, even on commentary. His announcing on Mox, his Blackpool Combat Club stablemate, added an extra layer to the possibility of them meeting in the blue versus gold final. Mox beat Jay Lethal relatively easily with a choke. I love and respect Lethal's career, but he is Team TNA right now, and I think his inclusion in this tournament at the expense of far bigger, more credible names is a detriment. We got a clip of despondent Eddie Kingston post Brody King loss where he was trying to self-talk himself out of a negative spiral. Which cut back to his collision opponent, Danielson, who did a great interview, saying he's not having self-doubts and he's got two breaks in his orbital bone. He's coming to win! But you... Actually, Brian, you... Maybe you should have more doubts. I don't want you to hurt yourself again. Tony Schiavone announced backstage that Revolution, the pay-per-view that will see Sting's last ever match, 
for now, will be held in the same venue that saw his first ever world title match. All the way back in 1988, the Greensboro Coliseum. Sting and his opponent from that night, Ric Flair, talked up their shared history. If this already feels like a big historic deal three months away, strap yourself in for lots of tears on the actual night. Especially when Sting's final promo is brought to you by Woo Energy! Mark Briscoe and Roosh had the second Continental Classic match of the night, where, unlike Mox and Lethal's technical start, they just beat the crap out of each other. Roosh beat Mark in an absolute slugfest with the bull's horns, giving him his first three points. It's a shame Mark lost again, but perhaps he can now start a comeback story. RJ City took off a hungover Tony Storm's shoes for her and also hooked up a flirtatious Mariah May with a Tony Khan match booking. Wait a second. Is RJ City my favourite thing about Storm's new gimmick? MJF cut a great in-ring promo putting over Samoa Joe, how he paved the way for wrestlers like him, that Joe never got a fair opportunity in WWE, he said the thing, and while he doesn't like him, he respects him. Because Joe came here not to line his pockets, but because he believes in those three letters, A, E, W, yes, a CM Punk shock. Off CM Punk. At World's End, Max made a babyface promise, which wrestling rules dictate should not be broken. He'll show Joe it's about the size of the fight in the dog. He'll have to put him down to beat him. Even though MJF has already beaten Joe, the story, the mic work, the characters are doing enough to make me invested in the title match. But then step aside, CM Punk WWE return, we got a far bigger angle. Retribution to AW confirmed. I'm being glib. I enjoyed this a lot but the strobe lighting. Oh no, the faction have got control of the production desk. And the tack on Max, where four of the devil faction were easily chased off by Joe, did come off a bit weak. The TV feed then got took over by Courier Font, which asked, will you face the unknown in a tag match? Are you a hero, Max? MJF agreed to a tag match next week against the wishes of Joe. With Winter is Coming the week after, we could be building to the Devil's Reveal. Wardlow came out next to destroy AR Fox for the last ride with ruffled hair, almost like he'd just been chased off from a Samoa Joe. This is the best version of Wardlow since his Max Henchman role. Why wasn't he booked like this as TNT champion? Dante Martin made his return from that potentially career-ending injury, tagging with Top Flight to beat the Hardy Party. Talking to Renee backstage afterwards, Penta set up a match between them and his Lucha Boys. Julia Hart defended her TBS title against Emi Sakura next in a House Rules match. What are the rules? What are the rules? What are the rules? That you can't win via submission. It's very clear, actually. It's almost like Julia Hart is doing House of Black better than the rest of the House of Black. Her improvement and performance over the last six months has been so impressive, from her charisma, character work, wrestling, and even selling, just having a slight twitching hand off a crossbody into the steel steps. She has gotten over so much, she's booked as a badass babyface. It's genuinely one of the more surprising things to happen this year, and Vince McMahon sold WWE and CM Punk returned. Hart had her submission locked in, but realized she couldn't win with it. She hit a moonsault instead to retain. This was really great. I just wish it was longer. After Copeland took out both Luchasaurus and Nick Wayne, Christian made his way down to the ring with five security guys who might as well have been wearing t-shirts that said, I'm going to get speared. Swerve? They didn't. It was all part of Christian's manipulation. He likely just brought them down to send them away, coaxing Copeland into a false sense of security. But Christian really had reflected on himself and meant it when he said, I'm sorry. He brought up their shared career and personal history together, how Copeland grew up without a father, which got a big reaction, but that made them brothers. Let's team together again for your mum, who passed away a few years ago. It was all a ruse, with Christian trying to get out of their TNT title match in Montreal next week, but Copeland was wise to it. He stopped a belt shot with a low blow and emphatically delivered Christian's line from the start of this feud right back at him. Go F yourself. One other note, when Christian said kill Switch's name, he accidentally said Luchasaurus first. That is some impeccable story within a story building. And the main event saw the best gold match so far for me with Swerve Strickland versus Jay White. Swerve has so much momentum right now, AEW are leaning into a badass tweener turn. Quite the change from invading a man's house and cutting a promo on his baby just last month. Just like the lethal match, Strickland was booked as the face against White, smartly without losing his heelish edge. A heelish edge 
that arguably won him the match. Because in a great piece of tournament storytelling, White went for the same low blow trick he pulled to beat Roosh last week, but Swerve had it scouted. It takes a heel to know a heel. They traded a few more great near falls, got a this is awesome chant, and Swerve got the technical pin on White just after the 15 minute call. But in Strickland tied at the top with Moxley on points. And just as exciting as Swerve is a potentially darker path for White, who looks psychotically dejected after he lost. This was a terrific, focused episode of wrestling television. This week's Dynamite is 85%. And exciting news, board game fans! We're launching a role-playing game channel called Chaotic Neutral. Watch the announcement video now with El Fakador, Laurie Blake.